other cities around the world might decide to make a new cathedral and thereby increase their carbon footprint, York has decided to make do with the same old minster for now well over 500 years. And rather than build a new city wall, we have been muddling through with the same old city wall since the 12th century. And this demonstrates, I think, that sometimes it's OK to reuse and mend old things rather than keep buying new ones. York also recently announced an ambition to make the historic centre of the city car free by uh, 2025, so in just five years time. And although the details of how we're going to achieve this has remained pretty scant at the moment, this illustrates, I think, that uh, answering those kind of, these kind of big environment sustainability questions are difficult. And it's for this reason that uh, for this event tonight, we want to focus not on those big questions necessarily, but what we can do at household level uh, to make our lives more sustainable. So uh, a couple of words on the format for this evening. Many of you have already kindly submitted questions in, in advance, and we will try to answer as many of these as possible this evening. Uh, but if we don't get to your questions, please don't worry, we will post detailed answers to all questions on our uh, that have been submitted on our website over the coming weeks. Uh, and on that website, you will also be able to post any pictures that you might like to send us to illustrate your Green Christmas ideas, either by using the hashtag York Green Christmas or by emailing yesi at york.ac.uk under the subject line York Green Christmas. Uh, we'll also award prizes for the best of these, although when I say prizes, I mean highly environmentally sustainable virtual Christmas stars. We will also be taking questions from the audience this evening. So if you'd like to ask us a question, please post these uh, using the Q&A uh, box, which you should see at the bottom of your screens. And uh, if you'd like to ask the question yourself, please just use the phrase, I would like to ask, followed by your question, and we'll be able to turn on your mic and uh, everybody uh, will be able to hear you. So it just remains for me to introduce our panel of experts. And of course, as we must do at all public events, to point out the fire safety measures for this evening, which are as follows. In the unlikely event of fire, please leave whatever building you're currently sitting in by the quickest and safest route. Uh, that was easy. So then, our panel. Uh, let me start with Sarah. Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Sarah West. I'm the Centre Director of the York um, Environmental System. I'm not even that. Oh man, it's been a long day. Um, so I'm SEI York's Centre Director. Um, sorry, Daryl. No, no, you're fine. And can you, are you going to introduce the cat as well? Yeah, so that's my cat, Tessa. She's old and very needy. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Esther, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm Esther and I work at St Nick's Environment Centre in York. You did a lovely introduction about us. So we do all kinds of things, so including our, as you said, very own nature reserve. We also have volunteers, we have our mental health service, ecotherapy, um, we do sustainability events, we have a recycling team, uh, all kinds of things like that. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, jo, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jo. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of York in the Environment and Geography Department. My PhD isn't related to the greenhouse gases of food or food waste, but it's something that I'm really interested in. And I've been involved in projects looking at this and various outreach projects as well in the past. Brilliant. Thank you. And finally, Bryce. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I'm Bryce Stewart. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in the Environment and Geography Department and the Director for Engagement and Partnerships. Um, by training, I'm a marine biologist. So any questions about fish, about the ocean in general, um, yeah, I'll do my best to answer them. Brilliant, thank you very much. So we'd like to start with a general question to all the panelists so we can get to know you a bit better. And that question, perhaps starting in the same order, starting with Sarah, do you have a favorite Christmas tradition? Uh, yes, we like to put stockings out, um, regardless of age. So my 94-year-old grandmother gets a stocking and um, the babies in the family get a stocking. And it has always a satsuma and some nuts in the bottom of it, some chocolate coins if you're lucky, and useful things. So Father Christmas in our house gives us things like toothbrushes um, and socks and uh, crayons, I think is what our, we've ordered this year. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Esther? I think one of my traditions is wearing this hat 
So uh, me and my husband fight over this hat. And I was saying before, sometimes I forget it's Christmas hat and go out, go out wearing it because it's nice and warm. So yeah, that's my tradition. Excellent, thank you, Jo. Um, so on Christmas day at about 7 p.m. when we're starting to get a little bit peckish again, we like to have all the Christmas leftovers in a sandwich with gravy. That's very similar to our traditions, yes. And uh, Bryce? Yeah, so uh, you may, may or may not be able to tell, but I'm an Aussie. So uh, Christmas for me is having a barbie and uh, particularly Boxing Day. I'm from Melbourne. So my Christmas tradition, if I can do it, is to go to the Boxing Day cricket test match at the MCG and to eat uh, turkey and cranberry sauce sandwiches. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Well, that's excellent. And so staying on the subject of food, and perhaps we'll stay with you, Bryce. Um, uh, so we have a question submitted. Um, what one thing could I do to make my Christmas dinner more sustainable? Yeah, so for me, so I, I am going to I'm going to go play the seafood card. So a lot of people like to eat salmon at Christmas, uh, either whole salmon, smoked salmon, um, particularly I think Christmas uh, Eve, I think is a bit of a tradition. Now, I would, I guess, ask you to think twice. Um, almost all the salmon in this country is farmed, 99% uh, of it. The little bit that's not farmed is endangered, so you don't really want to eat that either. Farmed salmon uh, can be okay if you go for organic or RSPCA freedom food salmon, but that is fairly hard to find. So I would probably suggest that if you really want to eat some seafood, you go for something different. Um, there's lots of nice local fish and to ensure it's sustainable, the best thing to do is to look for an eco label by the, the Marine Stewardship Council, the MSC. And this is like a blue fish with a tick in the middle of it. It's actually widely available in many supermarkets. And so that's a, a, a benchmark effectively that it's a sustainable product. And there's lots of species. So even quite a number of local species. Um, hake, for example, is a really great local fish that um, is also certified as sustainable. So see if you can find that. Brilliant, thank you. Could uh, we ask the same question to uh, Joe, please? Yeah, I was just taking notes on what Bryce was saying as well. That was really useful, thank <laughs> <Yeah>, you. <me. laughs> so. One thing you could do to make your Christmas dinner more sustainable would be to think about how you're gonna use up your leftovers. So globally, food waste contributes 6% uh, to all greenhouse gas emissions. So if you plan out what you're gonna do with your leftovers, you can stop that food going to waste. If you've had a turkey, for example, you might wanna slice it up and then put each of those turkey into portions in boxes in the freezer or separate it with pieces of greaseproof paper so that you can take out um, what you need at any one time. And if you're struggling of how to use your leftovers, the Love Food Hate Waste website has a little tool where you can put in the leftover food that you have and it'll give you a recipe of um, how you can use it as well. Brilliant, thank you. I Sometimes I think we start, in my house, we start planning leftovers before we've even started cooking the main meal. So I think there's, there's curries to be had out of this on Boxing Day. Great, thank you. Uh, Sarah. Um, so the best thing that you can do would be to um, not have meat or fish um, for your Christmas dinner. Um, I found a very, very lovely um, nut roast recipe the other day and I'm happy to share the link in the chat screen. It was amazing. Um, so that would be the best thing that you can do. Um, and if that's hard um, to take for some members of your family, my father-in-law is coming for Christmas and that is not gonna go down well for him. Um, so we have chosen some grass-fed beef um, so I think, say, if you can afford to, have a look at what other options there are in terms of um, um, maybe grass-fed grass -fed products are generally better for um, in greenhouse gas emissions um, and also animal welfare. Um, so you might want to have a look at those options as well. But I think the other suggestions are great. And certainly whatever food you're planning on having, thinking about how not to waste it um, is very, very important. Brilliant. Thank you. And Esther, and I wonder, I know um, St. Nick's at the moment has a plastics project, so maybe um, 
uh, there's something to be said about plastic packaging with uh, our Christmas meals as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have a very exciting project at the moment called Precious Plastic York, which is all about how we can turn our, our plastic rubbish into funky, interesting objects. So I can, I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so yes, it's worth thinking about your packaging. So, you know, always good to, you know, we, uh, yes, we recycle, that's fantastic. But we always say, can you actually avoid using anything uh, that you're going to waste or is going to be single use in the first place? So that's always good. And there's some very interesting different ways of avoiding packaging. So I have a veg box, for instance, with the added bonus, you're getting local veg there. And, you know, that's pretty good. Um, so I think as well as that, thinking about uh, your veg peelings. So I can't believe I'm not a gardener, um, but I can't believe how easy it is to have a little compost bin. We've only got it in the yard. Um, it's absolute joy uh, making your own uh, compost for your garden. So think about that as well. Brilliant. Thank you all. Uh, so our next question has been submitted. It it's, uh, requires a bit of data. I'm going to ask Sarah this question. Uh, what are the average carbon emissions of UK households resulting from using Christmas lights? Okay, okay. yes, as you say, this requires a little bit of data. Um, so we did some digging into this. And the good news is, is that actually, particularly if you're talking about um, LED lights, which most Christmas lights that you can buy nowadays are, is actually it's not a huge amount at all. So... Um, it's about 14 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. So basically that means carbon dioxide and all of the other um, gases in the atmosphere um, that are equivalent to that when you're looking at warming. Um, so it's about 14 kilograms and that's equivalent to about 60 miles of car travel. Um, that's if you're using LED Christmas lights. If you're using incandescent bulbs, um, it'll be about 10 times higher. Um, if you've got very extravagant displays, um, those who are in or around York um, might know Twinkle Pike Way um, in Wigginton, um, which is an amazing display, um, that could be much, much higher, um, so equivalent to 3,800 miles of car travel. Um, so, yes. So um, if you're thinking about just putting a little string of lights outside your house um, and it's LED powered, then um, probably not too much to worry about. But perhaps if you're going all out and your street is all going a bit mad, then um, you might want to consider perhaps not having it on all the time. <laughs> Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. And thanks so much for, for finding that data. I know this is not always easy to find. It's quite difficult sometimes to make those calculations and those conversions. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, unless anyone, any other members of the panel have something they want to add on the subject of lights and power, I think we'll move on. And this next question is, is about food. So I'm going to ask it, ask Joe. And uh, impressively, this question was sent for, from Harare in Zimbabwe by Sarah. And she asks, uh, Christmas cakes, biscuits, stolons, mince pies, etc. Um, there's a lot of ingredients these that, in these that are not grown locally, like the spices, raisins, almonds, etc. To be truly environmentally friendly, are these goodies? Uh, to, to be truly environmental, uh, to, to be uh, to be truly environmentally friendly about these goodies, what are the options apart from being a Scrooge and, and foregoing them entirely? Yeah, so thank you, Sarah, so much for submitting this question. I thought it was really interesting and definitely something that I've been thinking about as well. So the good news is you don't need to be a Scrooge and stop buying all of these products. Transport actually contributes very little to the greenhouse gas emissions associated with a food product. If we take beef, for example, beef has a very, beef has a very, sorry, Beef has a lot of greenhouse gas emissions associated with its production and in fact transport accounts for less than 1% of that and for most foods it's, it's less than 10%. The majority of emissions associated with producing our foods come from land use change and on-farm emissions. And then if we think about which transport is most environmentally friendly, in terms of food miles, shipping actually releases the, the least carbon dioxide per food mile. And that's partially because we can fit so much food on a ship than we can in a van or a lorry or on a plane, for example. And then if we are thinking about, well, what is the environmental impact of air freighting? It's got 50 times the amount of carbon emissions per food mile than shipping does. 
but only 0.16% of food is air freighted. So if you're worried about how your food is being transported, the only foods that you need to worry about coming from air freighting are things like fresh berries, which would spoil easily and can't be frozen, and asparagus. So those are the only two products that I would be wary of buying if they're not from the UK. Otherwise, you're all good and you can enjoy your spices, your stolen, your Christmas cake and mince pies. That's brilliant. And it's great to have good news. <laughs> we can eat these things. That's brilliant. Um, can I ask, if the, the, um, are there any other members of the panel that would like to add anything on that subject? So I can add something not directly about um, food miles, but about carbon emissions. So I, I'm going to go back to seafood, obviously. So a lot of people are surprised to learn that um, certain shellfish like mussels and uh, oysters and scallops as well, if they're farmed, are actually um, net uh, sequesterers of carbon. So the great thing about these species is that they don't need any extra food. They just take their food from the water column. They therefore don't need any chemicals, any sort of medical treatments and the, the sorts of issues that you have with salmon farming. Um, and they actually absorb carbon. So their shells are made of calcium carbonate. So they absorb carbon as they grow. Uh, and um, they also actually provide habitats when they're being grown, either on the seabed or on ropes and other structures for other species. So as a seafood choice, it is really hard to beat those types of shellfish. Um, they're actually a fantastic choice, I would have to say. Brilliant. Thank you. Also, good news. And so although this question was about was about food miles and about importing food, um, also it, it, goes, it also talks about growing food locally. I wondered, Esther, if you wanted to say something about um, uh, some of St. Nick's work with um, uh, local gardening, garden, you know, like growing projects. Yeah, sure. And actually, um, I was I was thinking about something that we we're talking about um, ahead of this meeting. Um, but yeah, we do link in with different um, people who are doing specific work around community gardens. And we ourselves run a group that's called Bearing Fruit. So that's run through our ecotherapy project. Um, but I'm kind of thinking about the, the wealth of things you can kind of forage around St. Nick's and other community gardens. There's some beautiful crab apples. I, I recently made crab apple jelly with jalapenos in, which has gone down a storm. And we were, I'm kind of stealing someone's idea because we were talking about uh, Christmassy gin uh, just before we started. And yeah, I've, I've been gathering little bits, you know, you do need to know your berries, but I've been gathering brambles and sloes and things that you can put in your gin, put some sugar in, I think, um, and shake it up. So we've, we've unfortunately got slightly addicted to that. Um, so, so yeah, so we don't, we don't so much have uh, grow food at St. Nick's ourselves. We do link in with people who who do things and people like the food circle as well who um who use food uh, that would be going to waste to make fabulous beautiful food with based at town hall community center but yeah get foraging that's why i say yeah, brilliant thanks Les. i'm not sure you said we <laughs> sending the right message to say we were discussing christmas gin before this meeting uh, oh, no. obviously, cover. <laughs> obviously on the on in the context of foraging for local slows that's that's why we were talking about it brilliant so we have um another question uh, for all of you really um but we have a couple of videos that are, that are related to this topic uh and the question is how can we decorate the house in an eco-friendly way so i wonder jane if we could uh, play those couple of videos that um uh, uh members of the department here uh made for us Well, it's taking a while to load, Jane. While while we're waiting for that to um, uh, to load, uh, uh, Sarah, do you have any advice on um, on how we can decorate the house in an eco-friendly way? Um, yes, yeah, so yeah. I would. Oh, oh we've, we've got the snowflake moving. Excellent. I think I'll just pause just there. <laughs> Hold that thought. Yeah. Or not. Um, shall I keep talking? So, so I think one of the best things you can do is to go out talking about foraging um, and try and get some um, bits of greenery. That's what 
that's what we do is we we we're lucky enough to have a garden here so we get bits of um evergreen so bits of holly bits of ivy that's very Christmassy isn't it very traditional Christmassy and and bring those into the house um which is is really lovely actually so we put them on top of the um on top of the fireplace and we sit them on the table um so they really give a bit of kind of Christmas cheer um and then the other thing is that so we do still get sent quite a lot of Christmas cards even though we've never send Christmas cards um, but people still send us them so we string those up around the house um, and then we keep them and next year we cut them up and we use them for decorations um, or for crafting for, with my children or we use them as gift tags for next year so that's a that's a really nice thing to do. Brilliant thank you. Oh, While we're waiting Esther the, um, yeah uh, could you comment on this same question about eco-friendly decorations? Absolutely. I just want to say I feel your pain uh, <laughs> with the video thing. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so Sarah, I see you're foraging and I raise you one, or my colleagues, Sir uh, Freya and Hannah do anyway. There's a beautiful description of how to make your own wreath um, on our website, which is saynix.org.uk. So it involves getting willow and dogwood and keeping them nice and wet or, or making them very flexible. So you can put them in a bucket and kind of turn them every day or every couple of days to get them nice and wet. Um, but then put all the lovely things that Sarah mentioned in to make it look pretty. And you can also put in things like dried oranges and herbs and get really, really creative. So talking of creativity, are we segue into the think snowflake? Let's try it again. I'm going to show you how to make a snowflake out of a recycled document. Here is one that I made earlier and I'll show you how to make one from scratch. So here I have some old lecture notes that I no longer need. But instead of just recycling the document straight away, I can make a snowflake. So the first step is to fold the piece of paper in half and then fold it again into quarters, like so. And then it's really your choice how you want to design it. So you're going to need some scissors to cut it up. So I want to start by making it into a circle shape. So you can play around with the middle. You can make a little square. You can do some cuttings into the side to make some shapes. And these, in order to make it symmetrical, you want to make sure that you don't cut through the entire piece of paper but just into the middle. And you can cut any shapes you like. So I just cut a triangle and now I'm going to cut a slightly wonky rectangle. And on the rim you can cut some, some more triangles. Have fun with it and you can make any shapes you like. So this looks a bit odd at the minute. I'm going to open it up and see what it looks like. There we go, what a cool looking snowflake made from a recycled piece of lecture notes. And the cutoffs that you make, you can water down and make some paper pulp and decorate them into decorations as well. That's brilliant. That, that video was made by Livy, who's a master's student uh, here at York. Um, she does come to some of my lectures, but she, she's assured me that they're not my lecture notes that she's been cutting up. Uh, to make decorations. Um, Jane, we had uh, another video. We're we going to risk um, Joe's video on making decorations. Oh, I've lost Jane. I'm coming. I'm just going to share it now. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So I'm going to show you a lovely Christmas decoration to make. It also makes a wonderful activity to do with kids. You take oranges and stud them with cloves and dry them out. And so you'll want to slice up the oranges into about one centimeter thick, maybe a bit thicker, and then stud them with cloves. I've uh, in any pattern you like, can see I've made a variety. I've also used star anise because I ran out of cloves. 
Then I'm going to put them on a baking tray on a grid um, so that it improves the airflow around it, makes it easier to dry out. Um, and if you put them on baking paper, it sticks to the, to the baking paper. Uh, then you're going to put it in the oven and I'm going to put it in at 100 degrees for about three hours. Uh, you can also put it in at a slightly higher temperature, about 120 degrees centigrade, um, and then it'll take a bit quicker. Or you can do a lower temperature, 60 degrees for longer, about four hours. Um, as it warms, it will fill the house with the warm, rich smell of the citrus and spices. Um, and, and here's what they look like after three hours in the oven. They're not entirely dried out yet, but that's fine. And the oven just gave them a, a head start and the rest will dry out um, just in the air. And I've just used some ribbon that I got, that I've saved from a past present or uh, lint chocolates. And I'll be hanging that on my Christmas tree. Thanks for watching. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. So uh, we should ask, we should open out um, uh, uh, questions to the to the audience. Are there, is there anybody who would like us uh, has a question they'd like to ask us? Could do meringues at the same time. What an excellent idea, from Sarah. <laughs> Uh, I'm not seeing any questions being posted. In that case, we'll move on and we'll answer some of the questions that, uh, that people had, had asked us in advance. Um, so this is a good question for Joe. Um, what, uh, <laughs> what produces the most methane? So this is a climate change question, obviously. What produces the most methane? Raising dairy cows for years um, to milk and make cheese or eating a, a plate of Brussels sprouts? So a, a festive climate change question, Joan. <laughs> Thank you to whoever submitted this question because I really enjoyed researching it. <laughs> so a study on the composition of human flatulence found that the individual who passed the most methane in a 24 hour period passed 120 millilitres of methane. And the cow that burps the least methane burped 160 litres in a 24 hour period. Yeah. And another study on <laughs> Brussels sprouts found they increased flatulence by 44%. And I can't believe someone's done that research, but they have, and there we go. So even if you take the cow that produces the least methane and the human in this study that produced the most methane, the cow still produces a thousand times more than um, we would be passing. So if anyone was trying to use the facts and saying, oh, well, Brussels sprouts contribute to climate change, therefore I cannot eat them this Christmas, you'll have to think of a better excuse, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. It's fantastic that this research gets done. You know, some people think that, this, that, that, that us academics, we're always doing pointless research. This is cutting edge, important stuff, right? There was a, there was a related... I agree. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just said I agree. <laughs> there was a related question uh, that we saw a, a paper from um, a master's uh, research project about. And the question was, how should Santa feed his reindeer to reduce methane emissions and help combat climate change? Did you see this, Joe? And uh, the the the, the, um, uh, the master's thesis from the University of Toronto um, found that feeding that Santa should feed his um, reindeer lichen uh, rather than grass-based um, pelleted food because that massively reduced their uh, methane emissions. So that's good. And obviously, he should be some um, supplementing this lichen with um, his magic flying formula. Brilliant. Thank not you. soya. Definitely not soya. That's because that's the problem, isn't it? That's what a lot of um, animals get fed with in industrial systems as they get fed with soya. Um, and I think 90 percent of the world's soya goes towards um, feed stuffs. Um, so actually, that's a real problem because soya can be in large when it's when it's produced as it is in such large quantities. It actually is really contributing to emissions because there's massive felling of um, forests to plant the soya plantations. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's where a lot of the world's most of the world's soya is going going into. So, yeah, feeding the reindeer soya, which often which they would have to do if they ran out of lichen um, would would definitely not be the way forwards. 
there, there were a couple of questions in the Q&A, one of which I think you have more or less just answered. Um, it w related to how is eating grass fed uh, animals better for the environment when they consume an unsustainable amount of land? And yeah, so it's as I said when I mentioned grass fed beef, like it is, it, it obviously it is much better to not eat meat or fish. That's the much more sustainable alternative in terms of um, emissions um, and obviously in terms of animal welfare and things. Um, but the evidence around grass fed versus non grass fed is quite mixed. Um, and I think in the UK, um, it the research is showing that in many cases it is grass fed beef is better um, to um, than non, but it really depends on the system where the animals are being fed. So for example, not to be a bit snooty about this, but when you start talking about meat and ethical consumption, it does you do end up feeling a bit sounding a bit snooty, but um, my grass fed beef, um, we've got it from the Lower Derwent Valley um, National Nature Reserve. So it's actually performing a really important role there um, in keeping the forbs down. Um, so in keep, increasing the diversity of the site and um, doing some natural puddling um, providing habitat um, and locking down some carbon into the soil. So um, it really does matter um, where your meat comes from um, in terms of your emissions, if you are going to eat it at all. But as I said before, the best thing is to not consume it at all or dairy. So I have something to add on this topic. Uh, uh -huh. So it's, it's, it's some research from Australia where they fed cattle on seaweed. And um, I can't remember the exact figures, but that significantly reduced the methane emissions from the cattle. So I'm wondering if perhaps uh, Santa's reindeers would also benefit from eating seaweed. It, possibly lichen is just as good. Um, it, it would be an experiment that maybe we need to do. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. It was it was good to read this um that master thesis because they literally put um reindeer in a sealed chamber in order to uh, measure these methane emissions. This is important work. Uh, we, and you're right. We need to be doing the same. All we need to do is find a reindeer and some seaweed in York. Uh, how hard can that be? Exactly. <laughs> There's a uh, another question in the chat um, or in the Q and A rather. And it says, I made my own apple wine using secondhand gifted demijohns and reused bottles. I don't think it'll be ready for Christmas. So what would be your tips for a sustainable Christmas tipple? Does any of the panel want to, to want to offer some advice on um, sustainable drinks at Christmas? I guess it's kind of, uh, uh, Esther's perhaps covered this already by um, talking about um, uh, foraging for uh, ingredients to um, put in her gin. Yeah, I feel like I don't want to go on about the gin again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm partially, partially to blame for the gin one because it was me that started off that conversation beforehand. So what we tend to do is buy, buy a bottle of uh, regular gin from the shops. And then in the summertime, we've gone out and picked some brambles um, from the yeah from the fields near me and some apples as well that we've then frozen and kept until winter so that we can use it to flavor the gin that's my alcoholic contribution there but i don't know anything about buying sustainable spirits <laughs> brilliant thank you i wonder if there is an answer to that where perhaps we will um i mean i just the only thing i'd say is that you, there are lots of york um spirits producers york gin for example um and we also have lots of local york beer producers as well um including um um, well, lots of local York beer producers um, and lots of people are doing online markets as well this year. So there's there's regular Etsy online markets and um, there's face, regular Facebook markets. For those who are in York, there's a really nice group called Supporting um, Local Businesses in York this Christmas. And, and they've been brilliant. You can just post on saying, does anyone sell church candles? And people reply saying, yes, I sell them or you can get them at Pexton's or whatever. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I would recommend that. And there are lots of ideas for local places to buy things. And um, so you are not only supporting um, a local business, but you're also reducing the miles travelled to get it, particularly if you cycle to pick it up or whatever. I can pitch in on the packaging point of view. So with those local breweries, there's, there's quite often schemes where you can you can fill up a little demijohn uh, to take away and, and reuse. Which, is, was, which has got to be a good thing. But something I didn't realise till I started working at St Nick's is how much more valuable 
clear glasses than green glass. So I kind of think when you're choosing your Christmas tipple and you can't decide, um, then go for the one that's in a, a clear glass because it's more valuable as a recycled material. Mm. Brilliant, thank you, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've got some more questions coming in. Um, so one from Jenny Mitchum who asks, what type of Christmas tree is greenest, a real tree or a pretend, or, or a pretend one? And I think Joe, you'd, um, hadn't you looked into this? Well, sorry, not me. Oh, okay. I haven't looked into this. Sorry. <laughs> I can I can speak to that one as yes, well. Please. So I'm married to a forester, so there is this is an interesting uh, conversation we have. So the jury seems to come down to saying that it is a real tree. Now, if you've got a tree growing in your garden, obviously that would be the ideal, and then to take it in every year and and put it back. Um, so then also we're thinking, you know, in terms of where's your tree grown, so good, good if it's local as well. Um, but talking, you know, talking to our team, um, if you've got a pretend tree, please don't scrap it because you want to get a new one. So uh, look after it. Um, and if you really want to get rid of it, then please give it to somebody in need. And then same goes for your, if you don't manage to have a tree that you manage to repot, or I think you can even hire trees apparently, but again, how, um, where do you get them from and all the rest of that? But if you do get a, a root tree, think about the end of life. So you can recycle in your uh, hazel court, for instance, and so make sure you look after it. Another option is, um, when I say look after it, make sure you take it away to be recycled properly. Another option is some um, animal charities apparently will take uh, the trees for enrichment, or you can even use a bit of it to make a little kind of bug hotel in your own garden. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Esther. And um, uh, yes, you're right. I'm not sure there's it's possible in York yet, but there are various um, places uh, um, where you can now hire your Christmas tree. You can um, indeed hire them from York. I found out on that same Facebook group that I was telling you about. So yeah, go and look at support local businesses in York this Christmas and you can find at least two places where you can rent a Christmas tree. Brilliant. What a fantastic thing. So that, tr that tree is obviously kept alive uh, and you can maybe even rent the same tree next year and be reunited. Brilliant. So we have a question from Steph Richards, um, which I'll ask you, Sarah, if that's all right. Uh, are there any tips you can recommend for sustainable alternatives to wrapping paper, wrapping presents? And there's a bigger question that follows. Uh, any advice on buying sustainable presents and reducing a footprint at uh, the consumer stage? But perhaps we'll start with a sustainable wrapping. Oh, I was going to start with the second oh, question. Oh, no, then please do. Please is do. that right, Daryl? Because actually yes. the second question is much, much more important. Like, so wrapping paper, like, that's important. But actually, the root of all our emissions is our consumption. So if you can lower your consumption, that is the thing you need to be doing. Now, we've moved in my family to doing secret Santas, um, which is amazing. So for... Um, adults we just draw one person one name and we buy them one present um, instead of everybody spending like maybe not huge amounts of money on getting stuff that people didn't really want we ask people so so we have a budget of 30 pounds um, and we say people make a gift list what would you like and they actually are asking for things that they genuinely really would like um, and you're allowed to buy secondhand things for people in that. Um, we do a lot of that. We do a lot of Facebook Marketplace and a lot of eBay. Um, and if you can secondhand or pre-love, that is the best thing that you can do because you are not then using any more emissions to create that project. So all the emissions associated with you buying that are there it being transported by Royal Mail or whatever courier you're using to get it to your house. Or like I do a lot of local Facebook market posts. So it's just literally me cycling on my bike to meet somebody to go and pick it up. So if you can try and reduce the amount of presents that you're giving to people, and if you are buying presents, buy them secondhand, that is the biggest thing that you can do. And then also, I mean, I can talk about wrapping as well, um, if you'd like, but let's let someone else talk about reducing your consumption of stuff at Christmas. Yeah, so um, absolutely couldn't agree more. You know, it's about thinking about how, what we consume and it's going to have far more of an impact. Um, yeah, just to plug the Precious Plastic York project. So we do have some beautiful rewards on our crowdfunder where you can buy ex experiences rather than objects. Um, and of course, the objects that we are um, giving us rewards there are upcycled using clean energy. So that's another way to, to think about it too. Um, so would you like to talk about um, wrapping paper? Yes, by all means. Would you like to go first, Sarah? Or? Oh, okay, so um, 
Yes, I think, that, you know, again, it's about being creative, a bit like when we were talking about the decorations. So um, save wrapping paper. I haven't bought wrapping paper for years. I just save it for every year when I get given it. Um, I think another thing would be, um, we were talking before about, um, I can't, I cannot pronounce this uh, art. Is it Furushiki? Um, somebody did a beautiful pronunciation when we were talking about it before. But um, yeah, you know, the art of wrapping things up very beautifully in, in a knotted fabric. Um, and I, what I've done is bought um, scarves from charity shops and cleaned them and ironed them. And so that's a really nice thing to do. Again, you can get a little bit of foliage to make it look pretty. Um, just so many different ways you can you can make things look good and it's a bit more personal. If for whatever reason you do end up um, you know, buying wrapping paper, please, please make sure it's not plastic. Please make sure it's as paper as possible. No glitter, because we're not able to recycle that. There's not much we can do with it. And it will make our recycling team quite grumpy um, when we come back from Christmas break. So think about the recyclers um, and please leave the glitter in the plastic uh, in the shops far away from us. Brilliant. And while we're talking about plastics, um, uh, Bryce, did you want to say something about plastics in the oceans? I mean, uh, yeah, I can say a few things. So obviously, um, everybody knows plastic pollution is a big problem. Um, and from my point of view, uh, most plastic pollution, if it gets loose in the environment, it ends up in the waterways, in the drains, and then in the rivers. And all that goes to the sea. Um, and it's estimated that uh, we're releasing something like 8 million tonnes of plastic uh, into the sea every year. Um, and there's some shocking things going on out there. Seabirds in particular, it's estimated may already, 90% uh, of seabirds have some plastic in their stomachs. And within the next couple of decades, that will be probably up to 99%. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I probably don't need to tell most of you about these problems, but yeah, you know, when you've, you know, I, unfortunately I've seen some of the consequences of plastic in the oceans and it's really not a pretty sight. Um, so it, it serves as a motivation to try and do the right thing. Um, but I have uh, a couple of suggestions on the other topics. So in terms of wrapping paper, one thing we do is just use tea towels so we actually have some quite nice tea towels and especially for the presence within the family, you know, who do, like the kids don't really care, do they? You know, so, but you can make them look kind of nice enough. Um, and, and then you just use them to do the dishes afterwards. Um, <laughs> and then in terms of gifts, this is not a, a second hand gift, but I think it's a would be a nice company to support a local company called Seagrown. Uh, who are based out of um, Scarborough and they're a seaweed uh, farming company and so growing seaweed is great because seaweed grows um, incredibly fast particularly the kelps that grow off our, our shores and then obviously in doing so the plants are, are storing away carbon um, but some of that seaweed is harvested and this uh, particular company Sea Grown has some great little gift products so it's sort of mixed the seaweed with various herbs and spices they have an online um shop but also i i'm sure i've seen it in morrison's as well um and so check that out but more importantly than that uh seaweed is some people say it's the future uh, it's a bit of a wonder food um and it's also can be used in lots of other things so including biodegradable plastics so at the moment, this company is at a fairly, fairly early stage, but um, obviously with the right support, it can grow and it start contributing to some of these other very environmentally sustainable industries. So check them out. I'll put the, the web link in the chat. Brilliant, thank you. <coughs> I've already made a note, that's great. Thank you, and um, Jane, I noticed that actually on that subject of uh, wrapping presents in cloths, just like uh, Bryce's use of tea towels, that um, Sarah sent a tweet that had uh, uh, that image. I wonder if we can share that. Uh, perhaps we'll, I, maybe I can put that in the chat. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, it's not the world's greatest picture. It was a bit <laughs> dark. Um, but yeah, I just bought this massive. I got. Um, I bought secondhand a massive bundle of fabric off Facebook, um, and um, there are lots of them are really nicely like if this was me I wouldn't bother hemming it but the person before it actually hemmed them and everything and so I've got these really lovely bits of wrapping paper and it's really nice actually having the same wrapping paper coming out each year and um, you, you feel like oh there's that I remember last year I gave that to so and so and you know they go to other people's houses and eventually make their way back to us sometimes which is really nice the other thing we do for wrapping paper is we get a, um, a toilet roll subscription service um, called who gives a crap and they come in really nice wrapping paper um, and we save those and we use them for wrapping small things and um, throughout the year if it's children we have to cut off the bit that says crap because <laughs> um but um, yes yeah, so that's that's something else we do i have to say the reason i found out that father christmas wasn't really real was because when i was little i remembered that i'd seen that wrapping paper the year before at my grandparents house and so that was what spoiled the magic for me so <laughs> I, you, if you do it. that you have to be careful you, you lost me there, Sarah, something about Santa not being real. Uh, yeah, I, I can't, I'm, I'm sure we've got good scientific evidence uh, about uh, Greenland ice shelves where I know Santa lives. Um, we also, Jane, we had a, um, uh, a video from one of our students, didn't we, uh, who was, um, uh, made a Christmas cracker. Uh, could we share that perhaps? I can try. Thank you. A free sheet of paper, um, double sided tape, gonna rip a bit off, stick it on the center of the edge, okay. take off the thingy and stick a toilet roll there, add the other two to the sides, why not? Then roll. Yeah. Place something on there once you get more tape. And do the same on the other side. Take out the um, toilet rolls on the edge, on the sides, and then oops. get your favourite string, this is my favourite string, and tie a bow. your prize in. This is a highlighter reefer, an environmentally friendly prize. And then twist the other side. Get your second favourite string and tie a bow again. Whee! Christmas cracker, the new toilet. That's brilliant. I, but that's, that was uh, from Jenny, who's one of the students here at York in, in the Environment Geography Department. I like the fact she was excited to find a prize that she herself had just put in there seconds ago. <laughs> that's the kind of enthusiasm uh, we need at Christmas. That's great. And I, I, I don't know if everyone's keeping an eye on the chat, but a great um, suggestion from Ivana of using old maps as wrapping paper, uh, which I think I will try. I hang on to these maps for years and years even though I know that I would probably die if I head to the hills with maps that don't have the right roads on them. So I'm going to try that. We had a great question from uh, Joe Hossel, um, which I'd like to ask all the panel members, please, um, which is, what is your favourite green present, uh, either received in the past or hoped for in the future? And perhaps if we could start with Joe. Yeah, so I have to be kind of quiet here because I bought some for my mum for Christmas and I've been gifted them before in the past as well. It's um, like reusable cotton pads for removing makeup or washing your face with. I just think that's such an amazing idea because usually I would use one cotton pad twice, once on each side and then bin it. Whereas now I've got a set of 15 that I can reuse and just chuck in the wash. 
So that's really helped me cut down on my on my waste as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Esther, do you have a, a favourite Christmas present that you've either received or you're hoping for? Um, so my favourite thing I ever got for Christmas was my compost bin. I'm a complete convert. Just please jump in, do it. If you won't regret it. Uh, yeah, absolutely wonderful. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Sarah, any suggestions? On a similar theme, I once got a wormery for Christmas, which I loved. Um, sadly, it didn't survive the house move and it kind of disintegrated. Now I just have two massive compost bins. And like you, Esther, I feel like I'm a kindred spirit. I'm a huge compost fan. My, um, I have a coach and she said to me, what is it you really like doing, Sarah? And I was like, this is going to sound really weird, but I really love turning my compost. <laughs> She was like, yeah, that does sound really weird. And I was like, but it's so satisfying. Um, so yeah, that's probably, it my, was my best present ever. <laughs> yes, I do make a lot of compost. I have, I have more compost than I can actually use. I have to give it away and uh, just dump it outside with a sign, help yourself, it disappears very quickly. Uh, brilliant. Uh, Bryce, any suggestions on Christmas presents? Or, Gosh, or... I mean, I think a, uh, a restored secondhand bicycle I think that would be a good present to get, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're making sure it doesn't go to waste, but also obviously riding a bike is the most sustainable form of transport there is pretty much, I think, apart from walking. Sometimes it's a bit too far to walk. So, yeah, that would be a nice present for sure. Are you looking over my shoulder as you say that? Um, <laughs> oh, there we go. Full of old bicycles. I hadn't spotted that. <laughs> maybe it was subliminal maybe i'd seen it earlier <laughs> am i allowed to ask a compost question yeah, of course you are yeah since we've got two avid composters here someone told me recently that you can compost rubber so i've always been binning the rubber bands that came on um, spring onions but can you actually compost them am i allowed to do that are you allowed to ask i don't know the answer i don't know the answer sarah do you know the answer i've tried this accidentally and it it doesn't it takes too long in my home compost bin i reckon you if you had like an industrial compost bin it might get hot enough that you could do it s is nodding but i don't think you can do it in a domestic compost bin yeah i was i was going to say so we got quite excited this is the kind of thing we talk about at st nick's get quite excited about so we thought we were, somebody said did you know you can compost rubber so one thing is it's got to be rubber you know so, and we're like oh yeah of course it's from a plant all oh, right and again, I'm, I'm really excited, tried it, it hasn't worked. Um, we get a little bit annoyed sometimes at things that are said to be compostable. So, uh, you know, there's, there's some kind, you know, like cups and things like that, sort of single use cups that will be billed as compostable. But the small print is it's in the big industrial, industrial composters. Um, yeah, so pinch of salt with that one, I think. Yeah, I thank you. I suspect mine too doesn't get hot enough, but uh, you can, if you have a source of, of uh, manure to go back to our, our um, uh, discussion of emissions, um, then adding that to your compost will massively increase the heat. Maybe then we could try. It's an interesting experiment. Uh, we should think about it. We have another question in the, um, in the Q and A. Um, similar to our we're talking about wrapping paper, um, Joe asks, uh, Joe Hossel asks, uh, what are sustainable alternatives to tinsel? Tinsel being either aluminium or more often plastic. Esther, do you have any suggestions on this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna like really date myself here, but um, so when, you know, my seven, 1970s upbringing, we would thread uh, milk bottle tops and um, you know pie tins and things like that. Um, even sort of sweetie wrappers. I mean, you wouldn't really want the sweetie wrappers in the first place, I'd say, to you know, avoid them. But yeah, so you, you could thread it very well cleaned uh, aluminium bottle tops or pie tins and again, get creative. That, that sort of snowflake idea, perhaps you could do a little bit of that on some of the aluminium. And then when you're finished, of course, you could unthread it and you could recycle it. Brilliant, thank you. That sounds like the perfect answer to me. Uh, and I, you know what? That brings back memories of <laughs> milk bottle tops. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, from the 70s, putting them on bits of string and then used in the garden to scare birds off uh, young crops. That's what we used to do. Uh, now I sound unbelievably old. Uh, uh, I think that's probably the perfect answer. I don't think we need to, unless any other members of the panel have other suggestions for tinsel-like 
Um, I've, I've put a few in the, I don't know if people can see the answer that I've put to Joe's question in the Q&A, um, but I had a few other ideas. So um, popcorn um, can look really nice as well. So if you popcorn and then thread that on thread or string, that can look really nice. Um, I also had another idea, which was um, like you could crochet some, so I have some nice crocheted kind of star decorations, um, which actually look really nice. And especially if you're again reusing wool, um, charity shops are a really, really good place for buying wool because lots of people, when lots when elderly ladies die, they often have wool in their houses and they often just get all their stuff cleared out to a charity shop. So it's a brilliant place for buying wool. Um, so um, yeah, so that's another option. And I also saw something recently on Twitter, I think, which was somebody had saved all of their like satsuma and lime and lemon peels from over the year and they'd cut them out into a little star shape, dried them out um, and then just threaded those on. So they had like a multicolored garland and I thought that looked really nice. And I thought if only I'd had that idea like three months ago, I could have done that but I'm definitely not going to eat that much citrus <laughs> before Christmas so <laughs> I can't do it now but maybe next year. No that's also a brilliant idea and will compost uh, again you need your compost nice and hot to get rid of all those citrus uh, but is possible. Brilliant thank you so um, we actually had a question um, so as uh, um, uh, people may know the SEI here in York is one of several SEI offices around the world and a journalist um, who is anonymous, as far as I can tell, asked a question of the SEI um, uh, office in Sweden, and it got passed to us because it's on a Christmas theme. And it says that from a, the question is from a climate perspective, is it better to buy online or in the shop? Um, and what should we think about and take account of um, uh, when thinking of that? Um, Joe, did you um, have a chance to look at this question? Yes, I did. I thought it was a really interesting question and it's something that I was thinking about as well because I was buying my Christmas gifts online and then thinking, oh, hang on, is this what I should be doing? Is it better for the environment? I'm not sure. So I'm really glad they asked that question. And I think probably a lot of other people will be thinking about this as well. The Centre for Retail Research, I found out earlier, they predicted that online shopping will grow 25% this year compared to last year for obvious reasons, people not wanting to go um, out to the shops as much. There, there are several studies that have been done on this, but in short, the answer is it, it depends. There's so many different ways you can, you can model the different factors that come into play when you're ordering a product online to be delivered to your house. So one thing it really depends on is how many products you put in your basket and buy at any one time from, from that retailer. If I buy five products from a specific retailer, then per product, the carbon cost of, of getting it transported to me is much less than if I bought one product from that same retailer. And another thing that these models take into account when they're trying to calculate the carbon cost of, of um, transporting a product to you from online as well is, is how long you spend buying the product, since there'll be a carbon cost associated with you using energy to power your laptop and buy it in the first place. And then, Again, from a consumer perspective, if I've bought that product, am I now less likely to drive my car to the shops in, in order to buy things? So those are only three of the factors to be taken into consideration when modeling these things. There's, there's so much more coming into play. It's, initially, when I read the question, I thought, oh, that's a really simple question, but there's not a simple answer. And I think probably my advice would be like, do what you feel most comfortable doing at the moment. And when you are buying your Christmas presents, probably to plan out what you're buying beforehand, because it might be that you can buy multiple products from the same online retailer and cut down the carbon footprint associated with getting it to you. Those are my thoughts. I would add, um, if you're buying online, this is less of a problem these days because so many of us are working at home. But, you know, always give an alternative delivery address, like leave with a neighbour or you know, around the back or whatever, because a big part of the delivery cost is failed deliveries um, or the, and then therefore the carbon footprint, the emissions and all the rest of it. So, you know, that's obviously good for you <laughs> because you get your product when you want it, but also it makes a big difference to the environmental impact. And you get to make, make friends with your neighbours as well and spread a bit of cheer. So what's not to love? <laughs> No, brilliant. And uh, I'm just looking at the chat and seeing that um, uh, various people are um, sharing their advice on um, uh, 
green tips at Christmas. Um, uh, Jane saying that she has a Chinese money plant um, and it's really easy to propagate from that plant. So she gives a uh, little baby um, plants away as uh, Christmas presents. Um, this is true. My, my little brother, uh, everyone in the family has um, aloe vera plants because he and he forgets every year and gives us more aloe vera plants. Um, so they're everywhere. That's a good, um, that was a good idea. Do we have, um, and uh, someone else suggesting, uh, again, Esther actually, uh, uh, propagating succulents. Um, any questions from the floor? Um, what are we missing? Any quest any unanswered questions in the Q&A? I can't see any anyone brave enough to um, have their mic turned on and ask us a question. If they want to ask a question, they could put their, their name in the chat box and I can unmute them. Yeah, thank you, Jane. I could talk more about presence from a um, kind of just building on what we were saying before about experiences rather than things. And yeah, getting really getting that Joe's a big fan of plants. So uh, yeah, it's lovely to do that kind of swapping as well, isn't it? So it's like if you get into plants, it's, it's one of the joys to swap around. Um, but what about kind of acts of service for people? So, yeah, you know, obviously it's been, um, you know, we have, we have restrictions, don't we? But it's been a tricky, really, really tricky year for people. Um, how can we help out? Um, what could we do for people who might be, uh, have been shielding um, all the rest of it, or just a friend that's uh, in need of, um, you know, a skill that you can offer? So I think that's a lovely way to think about presence as well. Go, Sarah. Yeah, could I just say also, I think, yeah, that's absolutely right, Esther. And I think the other thing to say is that um, it's a bit of a cliche, but all this stuff is not just for Christmas. So, for example, food banks um, get absolutely inundated with food at Christmas time. And um, it's become a, a bit of a thing that people do that kind of reverse advent calendar thing. So in mid-November, they start putting an item in every day, which is amazing. And obviously at Christmas time, particularly people need people all coming together and well, not this year so much, but, you know, people do need lots of food. It's really important to do that. But, you know, to kind of spread that spread that giving out throughout the year is really important if you can do that, too. Um, and but just on the experiences thing, I think that's that's a really nice thing to do. And it could be like so I've started giving gifts to a very old friend of mine and we still keep giving each other presents every year. And she's really hit or miss with her presents. I really hope she's not watching. But it's cool. <laughs> I mean, it's just like they're either absolutely spot on, like a really nice warm pair of socks or they're like a really, really naff like photo frame, which I just immediately charity bag as soon as I get it. Um, and so we've started buying each other more experiency type things. So it's like, here's a little voucher that I've made you for you to go and have an afternoon tea, or next time I see you, I'm gonna take you out for a big slice of cake. And it's more of those kind of like, actually here's a, here's a gift of my time, um, which I think is really lovely. And my sister just had a baby and I've um, given her a gift of some um, local ready meals um she's just in south devon so i don't see her but um yeah and so those kind of things rather than stuff experiences rather than stuff is all good unless it's something like a jumbo jet flight that would probably not be very sustainable brilliant thank you and uh esther i know that st nick's has got this uh, upcycling uh project at the moment uh are there any christmas gift ideas that um uh spring to mind out of that yeah, I kind of feel like I've been shamelessly plugging it, but it is for a very, very good cause. So the project itself is a community project. So it's um, an international um, affair. And we're wanting to launch a precious plastic in York. So what we'll be doing is um, we already collect plastic. We'll be inviting people to work with us to collect plastic, to be able to bring it along to our workspace, shred it, and use our extruder and our injection mold to make different things and our compressor as well. So um, as well as being a fun activity to do, it's about changing hearts and minds about plastics. So, you know, thinking about there is no throwing things away. Actually, this is a material that could be used again and, you know, a lot more effectively than shipping it off to be recycled somewhere. But also get people thinking about design. So, you know, thinking about the circular economy, thinking about how we could what objects could we design to support that way of being? Um, 
So as part of our efforts to get hold of our machines, we, we are doing this crowdfunder that I've, I've put in the chat and I'll, I'll plug it again. But we've got all kinds of lovely rewards. Uh, we've got some objects like um, coasters and hatches and things like that. Um, but we've also got some experiences. So we've got uh, a tour around the treasures of St. Nick's and we've also got a kind of bushcrafty family session that you can, you can get. If you're feeling very generous, you can become one of our superstars and we'll put your, your name or your family's name, or your dog's name, we don't mind. Um, we'll put that, put your name in kind of, uh, you know, sustainable lights um, to thank you for your generosity. We are just um, a thousand pounds short of hitting a target, which means we'll get two and a half grand off Marks and Spencers. So please, please, please donate if you can, and please share. And um, we hope to see you when we've got the machines up and running. That sounds brilliant. Uh, and uh, as you say, both an activity and uh, 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 crafting and recycling all in one go. Uh, sounds brilliant. Um, we had a question from Zoe about um, cooking in uh, hay boxes, which I've heard of and, and don't know enough about. Um, Avana, it's lovely to see the chat with people now helping each other. Avana um, uh, posted a link uh, about hay boxes uh, work. And um, Zoe, um, Sarah, sorry, um, you posted a, re a response. I wondered if you could say a little bit about that, about the, the most environmentally friendly ways to cook. Uh, when we're thinking about cooking these big um, roast dinners at Christmas? Yeah, so um, basically the oven is the least energy efficient item for cooking you have in your kitchen. Mm. So the most efficient is your microwave, then it's your slow cooker, then it's your hob, and then it's your oven. Um, so what you want to do is try and to minimise the amount of time of things in the oven. So if you can par-cook stuff in the microwave to then finish off in the oven, that's how I do jacket potatoes, for example, if I've got otherwise. If I'm having the oven on anyway... I'll put them in there at the end. If I'm not, I'll just do them as um, just in the microwave. And um, so, yeah, I think it's about planning um, your meal. Um, I'm not really an expert on cooking um, meat, especially not meat in the microwave. So I, I can't comment whether that will taste nice at all. I did see a video of a guy who was suggesting that everyone cooked it in them. Um, I think it's called sous vide. They always talk about it on MasterChef, and um, which is like, I think sticking it in like a water bath but that just looked a bit hideous to me. But <laughs> apparently that is very, very effective way of cooking turkey, but who knows. Um, but I do think that that thing about like, what Joe was talking about earlier about um, ensuring there isn't food waste. So like if you are cooking meat, for example, you want to make sure that actually you've got a small portion. So maybe do you need an enormous turkey, particularly if it's only your immediate family for Christmas in COVID year. Um, so yeah, thinking about cooking small and therefore actually how can you cook that? And maybe you could cook it in a, water bath or something instead <laughs> yeah but I mean I, like I I know I keep saying about this but actually like there there it's more about the other consumption that's going on around Christmas um that actually is going to have a bigger impact um than how you cook your dinner no absolutely so we had um uh, a question about travel um uh which is, um, what about traveling to see family over Christmas, particularly people with far-flung far families? Oh, struggle with that alliteration. While you're there, Sarah, uh, is it a topic you can talk on? I know that uh, SEI has been developing travel tools to, so we can look at our carbon footprints from traveling. Yeah, so um, so we've done a lot of so we we behind the WWF carbon footprint calculator, and um, when people fill that in, whatever whatever they're doing um, is totally dwarfed by any emissions that they have um, by flying. So if you can avoid to flying to that person, that far flung family member, um, then you know there are alternatives. Um, so. Um, Rail and um, ferry are definitely greener alternatives than flying. Um, and then just try to do it less often. It's hard, um, but that's the fact of the matter. If you really want to reduce your carbon emissions, then flying is your, is your big, that's the big, big problem. Um, and you know, if it makes you feel better, you could try carbon offsetting. Uh, it's a controversial topic. Um, and that's because many carbon offsetting schemes are actually not, um, they're, they're basically providing funding for initiatives that would have gone ahead 
anyway, regardless of whether your, um, your funding was there. So if you are going to do carbon offsetting, I would strongly recommend that you do a lot of research around whether it is actually a genuinely new project that actually is going to be um, helping sequester carbon. Um, so for example, everyone thinks that tree planting is a really fantastic thing to do, but so much tree planting at the moment is actually going, uh, taking place on unsuitable habitats. And so actually you're losing um, carbon that is locked in the soil, that carbon is leaving the soil um, and going up into the atmosphere during the tree planting. So look, think really carefully um, if you are wanting to solve your pain of um, flying through offsetting. You're right, and it's astonishingly difficult to get a good answer uh, on offsetting, offsetting schemes. Uh, certainly I, was, I was quite surprised that uh, I, I thought naively when booking some flights remember in the years before, when we were still allowed to fly um, that uh, I imagine the university would have a, a simple offsetting supplier and of course it's not quite that simple. I mean Bryce are you prepared to talk on, on this subject with family in Australia? I mean you know what can I say uh, a global pandemic has reduced my carbon footprint. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was actually due to be on sabbatical uh, in Australia for the last three months so that's obviously not happened. Um, it's a really difficult one. You know, what what, what can I do about it uh, to reduce my carbon footprint? I mean, yeah, I do occasionally fly to Australia and, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want anyone to tell me to stop. I talk to my family um, regularly on Skype and Zoom and that's great, but it's nothing like being there in person. So... Yeah, I mean, in, in my case, I just try to be as environmentally conscious in everything else that I do um, to try to make up for it. And, you know, that's the best I can do, really. No, sure. <laughs> um, we have, a, 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 I'm not entirely sure how this is a sustainability question, unless it's a question about um, uh, sustainable fashion. But Zoe asks, uh, uh, do we need to think about what, what do we need to think about when it comes to Christmas attire, thinking especially about Christmas jumpers? And, uh, Zoe, do you want to elaborate on that question or is it a, is the concern that we're buying things just to be worn for a short period and then uh, discarding them? So last year um, in the department, I set up Christmas jumper day to raise money for safer children. And there were one or two frowns and rightly so, um, because Christmas jumpers aren't necessarily very eco-friendly. Um, so I was just wondering if the panel would be able to elaborate on that. Brilliant, uh, thank you. Uh, anyone want to pick up that question? Can I start? Uh, uh, yes, but you say start. It sounds like you've got lots to say on the subject. No, I mean, I think other people will have things to say too. Yes. <laughs> so there's so many problems with Christmas jumpers if you're thinking about buying a new Christmas jumper every year, like if you're thinking about like your dad's Aaron sweater that has a Christmas print on and has been coming out every year for the last 30 years, I think that's probably fine. But um, so all sorts of problems with Christmas jumpers, um, the ones that are kind of made, let's talk about like Primark type Christmas jumpers, okay? So you will have all sorts of toxic dyes being used in their production, um, often in places where um, there's poor environmental regulation. So actually that is just being released into rivers and cause, causing untold harm into the local um, rivers and also toxic effects on the people, the workers around. Um, so there's problems with the dye. Cotton is um, an incredibly um, a hungry plant in terms of both water and um, pesticides and fertilizers to produce. Um, and so most of the Christmas jumpers that you will be, people will be purchasing will not be organic cotton. Um, so that's another problem. So there's that issue. And um, there's also all sorts of issues around the actual kind of factory conditions, etc., at which they're um, uh, made in. And then of course they're shipped over here, etc. So um, Christmas jumpers are great if you can buy them secondhand. So, um, you know, and lots of people like, to, you know, they, they wear it for one year and then it, it, you know, that's it. Again, I always keep going on about Facebook Marketplace, but Facebook Marketplace is a really, really good place to get secondhand jumpers. Um, my daughter has a Christmas jumper day at school tomorrow and my childminder's son 
gave her his Christmas jumper. Um, so that's what she's going in tomorrow. So um, there are definitely more sustainable things that you can do. Um, um, so I think it's about being mindful um, and it's about thinking about, can you pass it on to somebody after you've worn it, who will then wear it again? That would be a sensible um, thing to do, I think. Brilliant, thank you. I, I, I never knew it was such a big issue, but you're right. Of course, anything that we're going to discard quite quickly is a, is a big problem. Joe, I got the impression that you wanted to say something on the subject of Christmas jumpers. Yeah, just to add on to what Sarah was saying about like um, giving jumpers to other people who might want to use them. If you know someone who's around the, the same height, size and build as you, you can just swap Christmas jumpers each year. So then you have a what feels like a new Christmas jumper, but is actually completely brand like completely second hand. So. I love that idea. Do you know, I don't even, I, I don't possess a Christmas jumper. So if anyone is looking and thinking I might be about your size, um, you could cycle to meet me. I would love your Christmas jumpers. <laughs> I guess the other thing is to wear it all December as well. You know, so, so you're not, you haven't got 10 different outfits. <laughs> that would cut down on things. I, I do I do a similar thing where I've been wearing the same jumpers for about 20 years. So, uh, I mean... <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I can't see any more uh, questions coming in and we only have a few minutes left. So um, I think um, I'll start drawing things to a close. Uh, but before we do so, we'd like you, to, um, the audience, to complete a very quick poll, which I think Joe and Jane have been preparing. Uh, brilliant. Um, and you'll notice the first question there is very Christmassy, um, which is uh, thinking about your environmental uh, and your green credentials. Do you think that this year you're on Santa's uh, naughty or nice list? So, um, and it, oh, annoyingly, it says here that hosts and panellists cannot vote. So uh, yeah, we'd really appreciate it if uh, people would um, fill in those short questions. And when you do so, we will have a look at the answer, particularly though the answer to that question one. Well, I feel slightly diddled that I'm not allowed to fill in that question myself. Obviously, nice list. Yeah, because I've definitely learned a lot tonight. So uh, I'd be ticking the so much button. I'm going to definitely do, Claire, you, you made a suggestion of drying the oranges out. So like Joanne's oranges, but drying them out on your radiator over the weekend. Like that, I am going to do that this weekend. I think that's such a lovely idea. And I was thinking exactly that. It's like, it would be so nice to do, but mm, what about the oven being on? Radiators, fantastic idea. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, pictures of all those of these ideas, really appreciated. If you can, uh, you can either email them to um, to yesi at york.ac.uk or you can uh, uh, use the hashtag York Green Christmas. We'll see them and uh, stick them on our website and it'd be good to, to share these ideas out. Uh, I've also find myself making notes. I'm particularly going to you know, have a look at um, uh, sea grown, uh, uh, Bryce's suggestion of seaweed based presents. That'll be, that will certainly shock my father. I think for me, it's the creativity and the fun of it. So rather than be feeling all hard done by, it's, it's just so much more fun than trawling around the shops and, and getting miserable and, and seeing it as how can you enhance people's experiences and have a lovely time together more than, you know, worrying about being really materialistic. So, yeah, no, it's been really inspiring. Thanks, everyone. Really? Esther, I wondered if we could have your crowdfunder in the chat again because I don't want to scroll all the way up but I do want to drop into it but of course <laughs> I have it here <laughs> well, that's lucky thank you thank you really appreciate Zoe has it. a question about the oranges do they not dribble down the radiators and make them all sticky mm. or do you rest them on something I think some experimental work has to be done here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll report back, Zoe. I will try it tomorrow and let you know. I'll tweet about it and let you know. <laughs> I can jump in here. So I used oranges that were actually about three or four weeks old. And 
we just hadn't got around to eating them. And eventually I decided I was going to try this orange thing. So they were pretty dry already. They didn't leak very much. Oh, and Claire in the chat is saying you can use paper towels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or tea idea. towels. Mm. Okay. Definitely some experimenting needs to be done. But I like the idea of using different citrus fruits so you get the different colours. Brilliant. And obviously we'll need some limes to combine with Joe's uh, uh, winter gin recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jane, is it possible to see uh, this poll and see how, whether people think they should be on the naughty list or the nice list? Ta -da. Well, look at that. 90% of people have, have self-awarded themselves green niceness. This is excellent. A mere 10% are still a bit worried. Uh, well, it's good because... Um, um, whether you've been good or naughty this year, there's um, uh, there's always more we can all do, I guess. Um, and so I hope that uh, many of you will also join us uh, for our New Year's resolution event, again, in partnership with uh, St Nick's, which will be on uh, the 12th of January. And we'll post details of that on, uh, on the website soon. The idea being to think about what we can be doing in the new year and uh, posting ideas. Um, so would there, there will be a short much shorter, about half an hour or so, Ask the Experts panel as part of that event from St Nick's on the 12th of January. So, thanks so much for everyone. Uh, I think we are basically out of time and we should be drawing this to a close, but thanks so much to the panelists uh, and thanks so thanks. much everyone for coming. And this is the flyer to the St Nick's event uh, on the 12th. So, have a good Christmas, everybody, and have a good New Year. And thanks again so much for coming. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Bye. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs>